one thing that I'm commonly asked about is how to identify diseases. And at Cornell University, one of the programs that I'm a part of is the New York State Beekeeper Tech Team. And we help train beekeepers in recognizing diseases in their own hives. So in this video, I want to teach you how to identify five different brood diseases that you might encounter in your colonies. And these brood diseases are found throughout North America. So it can be kind of tricky to feel confident in recognizing a bee disease when you see it in your own hives. And I think a lot of this is because not a lot of beekeepers have experience seeing diseases in their colonies. If you're a beekeeper with just a few hives in your backyard and if they've been fairly healthy over time, you might not see things like American foul brood or European foul brood popping up. So when they do pop up in your colonies, you might feel uncertain as to what it is you're looking at. There are some tools that you can use to help you diagnose diseases in the field. And so I recommend that you keep these tools in your caddy anytime you're going out to inspect your bees. Uh, one of my favorite things are these test kits, Vita test kits, that can help diagnose bacterial diseases. So you can buy test kits that are specific for European foul brood and also for American foul brood. And I always keep one of each on hand in my caddy when I go out. And this, uh, these tests are pretty simple. They work similarly to a pregnancy test, where if you see larvae that looks diseased, you can scoop up some of that larvae, follow the directions on the package, and you get uh, an indicator as to whether or not your hives are infected. Another tool that I like to use is toothpicks. So sometimes we want to look a little closer underneath chewed cappings or pull out any larvae or pupae that looks suspicious to see what's going on. And a toothpick is a perfect tool to be able to do that with. A varroa monitoring kit is always key. As I'll talk about in this video, uh, sometimes we have brood issues that are due to having high levels of varroa in the colony. So being able to monitor our levels can help us realize, oh, this is actually a Varroa issue. It's not something like European foul brood or a different disease. And another tool that I, uh, I use a lot is a flashlight. And not a lot of folks use flashlights when they're beekeeping because if it's a nice sunny day, you can use the sun to have the sunlight shine directly into brood cells to be able to see what's going on in there. But there are so many times when there's cloud cover or if hives are in a shadow that I've really benefited from having a flashlight to be able to shine and brood. And it just gives you such a clearer picture of what's going on, especially if you don't have great eyesight or if it just happens to not be sunny at that moment when you're in your hives. And then lastly, there are two disease books that can be helpful to have in your caddy to help you recognize what you're seeing. So as you're gaining skills and identifying bee diseases, there is a book by Penn State, The Field Guide to Honeybees and Their Maladies, as well as a book by the Bee Informed Partnership, Diagnosis and Treatment of Common Honeybee Diseases, that have really great photographs. So if you carry this in your caddy, if you see something weird in your hives, you can pull out the book, you can take a look at some of those photos, and they can help you figure out what's going on and what to do about it. And in this video, uh, we're only going to be talking about how to recognize diseases. Talking about disease management and prevention is much longer than what we have time for in this clip. Then I do wanna say that one of the most key parts about recognizing bee diseases is attention to detail. And this is something that is incredibly important as a beekeeper to have, and something that I too often uh, see overlooked when folks are inspecting their hives. So often when folks are inspecting their hives, they're kind of looking for this checklist of things that they're going through. They might pull out a frame that looks like this and say, okay, I'm seeing eggs, great. I'm seeing larvae, great. I'm seeing capped brood, great. Got brood of all ages. I've got a good population of worker bees. Uh, I've got some food stores. Everything looks good, I'll close it up. But if you're moving quickly through your colony inspections in this way, you might overlook some small signs that you can read about a colony to get information. And so many signs are in the brood nest. So when you're inspecting your colony, I think it's really important to take the time 
to look at about four frames of the brood nest. You know, you don't have to look at all of them, but looking at a subset of them will help you be um, comprehensive to make sure that you're catching any issues. And then when you're looking in the brood nest, I want you to scan your eye across all of these cells to see if there are any issues. And I'm going to turn on my laser pointer to make it easy to see. So anytime there's open cells, any spottiness, I like to look in those cells briefly to see if anything looks off. I'm always checking cappings to make sure those look good. And if you're looking closely, you might notice that there are a couple cells that have issues. For instance, this cell here, I can see that there is brood that is laying flat in its cell. And this capping has clearly been chewed off. I'm seeing some ragged edges here where that cell used to be capped. I'm also seeing another cell here. I know this bee is kind of covering a bit, but this is another one where the cell capping is chewed off and it looks like there's brood that's laying flat. So a quick look at this, we might only pick up uh, some of the bigger picture but when we look closer, we can actually start to see, okay, there's something going on with this colony. Let me take a further look and figure it out. Here's another example. Here's a frame where I've kind of brushed off the bees uh, to get a closer look at the brood. And we're seeing that there's a lot of cap brood on this frame. And it looks like maybe a lot of these bees have already emerged as adults. We've got some open holes here. And a quick look, this might seem okay. But as we're going closer and scanning our eye, Again, I'm noticing a cell that's telling me something. I'm noticing that the bees have detected there's an issue with this cell and they've started to chew open the cappings. And underneath, I can see that there's a pupa's head, an undeveloped pupa that is kind of right against that cell capping. And we'll talk about what these issues mean as we continue going on. But attention to detail as we're inspecting is really key. Get into your brood nests often and inspect them. If you are a hobbyist or even a sideliner beekeeper that has the time to be able to inspect your brood nests, the gold standard is to look at them every two weeks. If you are a commercial beekeeper and you have a lot of supers on your colonies at uh, many different, uh, or you know, for a lot of times of the year, your colonies are moving around and it's harder to get into those brood nests, just make sure you're going into them regularly, multiple times a year. You wanna be looking in those hives to screen for any diseases visually. So the five diseases that we're going to talk about today are European foul brood, American foul brood, sac brood, chalk brood, and parasitic mite syndrome. And parasitic mite syndrome is also called varroa mite syndrome. This is not specifically a brood disease, but a lot of the symptoms that we see when we're recognizing that syndrome are symptoms that occur in the brood. So I just wanted to start by talking about recognizing what are the signs of healthy brood. You know, before we can tell if something's unhealthy, it's good to know what healthy looks like. And this is kind of a quintessential beautiful frame uh, at the end of spring. This is a colony that shows us what healthy capped brood looks like. So the key things to think about with capped brood is that uh, there's not a lot of spottiness. So uh, we're seeing some empty holes here that don't have any brood in them or any food in them. And that's normal in a healthy hive to have, you know, 10% or fewer of the cells are open and empty, but we're not seeing a ton of spottiness. So this is normal and healthy. The cappings are not chewed. They don't have holes in them. They don't have really jagged edges. And the cappings also have kind of a slight convex shape. And I'll talk a little bit about this more later. When we're talking about healthy larvae, the larvae are going to be pearly white in color, just like we're seeing in this photo. And they're also going to be sitting in their cells in this special orientation where they look like they're kind of in a letter C shape. So these larvae are older. They're about to get capped soon. We have one cell here that's already been capped. And we also have some cells that have a little bit of nectar in them. That's some shine that you can see here, as well as some cells that have bee bread. So this is pollen that's been fermented with a little bit of honey on top that's causing that shine. But the focus here is on looking at healthy larvae, pearly white and in a C shape. 
All right, so let's start with one of the easiest brood diseases to visually diagnose, and that is chalk brood. Now, chalk brood is a disease that we tend to see in spring, although it can occur throughout the year. And it's a fungal disease, so it can proliferate easier in cool, moist climates, which is typically spring areas here where we are in New York State. And with chalk brood disease, this is, um, this is a disease that starts to infect the larvae and as the fungus proliferates, or I guess grows, the vegetative state produces these white filaments that fairly quickly over a span of days start to cover that brood's body. And it kind of goes from tail to head, uh, leaving the head of that brood, um, the head usually doesn't have the white filaments on it. And so over time, brood starts as looking healthy and then it develops these uh, white filaments of fungus and it eventually hardens into something that resembles a hard piece of chalk. And by the time the brood dies and is largely getting covered by these filaments, it's after the cell has been capped. So when the adult honeybees are recognizing that there's chalk brood, they are chewing open the cells and so we see this uncapping behavior. We see these jagged edges around each of the cells. So the honeybees chew open the cells, they recognize something is wrong. And sometimes if the bees have good hygienic behavior, they will pull out these chalk brood mummies is what we call them and deposit them at the hive entrance to try to clear out that infection. As the infection progresses over time and that brood gets completely covered in white filaments, some of the fungus will start to produce fruiting bodies. And so that's how it reproduces through spores in their fruiting bodies. And those fruiting bodies are black or gray in color. So here we can see on this dead uh, brood, we've got the, the black fruiting bodies as well as this white hard chalky piece. And there are a couple other brood cells that we can recognize chalk brood in here. We've got one right here that we can see those white filaments are overtaking that brood, as well as we can just kind of peek at the edge of this cell here where we can tell that there's that white chalky brood inside. And these larvae here aren't showing signs of those filaments yet. So they might be infected and they might start being overcome as they age, or they might be healthy and maybe they haven't been exposed to that fungus. So some of these still appear healthy and uh, a few of them like this one and this one and this one are showing signs of chalk brood. And here's another look at cells of chalk brood. Here we have a chalk brood mummy, uh, another one here. This one, we're starting to see those fruiting bodies. And in this one here, we can see that pre-pupa's head uh, the pre-pupa is the stage in between the larva and the pupa. We can just see its head hasn't been covered with those filaments, but the rest of its body has, and it's this bright white color. Same situation in this photo. And so this is a frame showing a lot of chalk brood in this colony. We can see there are tons of these bright white chalk brood mummies. A lot of these have already reached the fruiting body stage where we're seeing the blackness starting to overcome that chalk brood mummy. And eventually over time, that whole mummy or that whole dead brood will be totally black in color. And we can see the bees have been trying to remove this infested or infected brood uh, by chewing the cappings open and by pulling out some of that infected brood, leaving behind a spotty pattern. Here's another photo just to give you some more exposure. We're going to be going through a lot of photos in this video. Almost every single uh, cell that is has been opened here, we can see there's different mummies, either bright white or developing fruiting bodies. And sometimes we can see evidence of those bees performing hygienic behavior before we even open the hive. This is a photo of the hive entrance. Here's the little entrance where you can see a bee is exiting the hive right now. And a lot of bees inside of the hive have been pulling out these chalk brood mummies and depositing them at the entrance.
And then here's a look at another hive with tons of these chalk brood mummies. So uh, right here, this one is covered in those white vegetative filaments with just its little head exposed. And this one right next to it, we can see is totally covered in fruiting bodies. So what we're looking for with chalk brood are, uh, you know, either bright white uh, chalk-like pieces of brood or uh, with like gray or black speckles or even completely black uh, if it's been a while. And these mummies are hard to the touch. If you pick them up, they actually feel like pieces of chalk almost. And if you're looking at them inside of the hive, they're pretty easy to pull out, either with a toothpick or if you bang this frame against something hard, a lot of those mummies will come out right away. So that's how you recognize chalk brood. The next disease that we'll talk about is sac brood. And this is a virus that is the oldest virus that scientists have known about in honeybees. And sac brood is a virus that I commonly see in spring and not so commonly later in the summer or the fall. I'm not sure if that is the case everywhere, but just based on my observations of seeing sac brood, we're typically seeing it in the spring here in New York. It is not a common infection. I don't come across it often. Uh, only a few colonies here and there out of a few hundred that we're sampling every spring do we tend to find sac brood in. Chalk brood is a little bit more common. And with chalk brood, that can be seen most often if colonies are weak or if um, it's been, you know, one of those one of those springs where a brood nest might kind of be growing rapidly and there's not quite enough nurse bees to take care of the brood that's in there. Uh, we can more commonly see chalk brood under those conditions. But sac brood, um, I don't really know if there is a seasonal trend. Like I said, I tend to see it in the spring, but we don't come across it too often to be able to know if that's something that is specific to sac brood. So with this virus, um, the time that we're usually seeing these bees die is in the pre-pupil stage. So with honeybee brood developing, we usually are starting with a larva that sits at the bottom of its cell in a C shape. And then as soon as the cell is capped, that larva stands up in its cell with its head at the top and uh, spins its cocoon. And then over time, it's going to develop into a pupa, again with its head at the top of the cell. So here we can see that pre-pupal stage where that larva is almost standing up in its cell and its head is uh, exposed like this. And so when we're seeing sac brood, that's the symptom that we're typically seeing. Uh, we see these pre-pupae with their heads kind of curled up and they are changing color. So with sac brood, this brood becomes kind of swollen and fluid filled. If we were to pull out, I, I would suspect these two here, which kind of look swollen, although it's hard to tell without pulling them out entirely, you could pull out this uh, dead prepupa and you would see that its head is kind of sticking out and its body sort of resembles a swollen slipper. And if you were to have accidentally burst that prepupa, then there would be tons of virus particles that are released from all the fluid that is in its body. So with sac brood, we are, again, since it's the pre-pupal stage that they're dying, the bees are chewing away those cappings when they detect there's an issue. So we can see there's a cell here that's just starting to get chewed. This one as well, and this one as well. This one's been opened pretty well as well as this one. And if we were to take a toothpick and pull open the edges of this, I suspect we would start to see this classic case of sac brood, this pointy head that's starting to change color and turn brown. So we can see that there are several cells here that are impacted right now. So kind of here's a close up view of a larva that has sac brood. It's got that pointy head, it's turning brown in color. And you can kind of see in this photograph that the rest of its body is sort of like slumped down and spread out and uh, getting filled with that fluid. Then over time with sac brood, it kind of dries up. After that brood has died, it starts desiccating. It turns almost a black color. And as it kind of uh, sinks down into its cell and dries up, 
it forms a scale. So there's this little black scale that can stay in there. And if you take a toothpick and you pull it out, it comes out really easily. So that is sac brood. Then the next one that I wanna talk about is European foul brood. And this is the brood disease that I see beekeepers um, have the least confidence in diagnosing. And that's because it can look a little bit different. Uh, it can just look a little bit different for every colony almost. So I wanna go through a lot of photos here that show different stages of European foul brood, all of the symptoms that it can show so that you might be able to recognize it if it ever pops up in your colony. And European foul brood in New York state is similarly to chalk brood. We are usually seeing it in spring or if colonies are stressed. So this is a bacterial disease where larvae are fed the bacteria inadvertently when they're eating their brood food. And they tend to, I don't want to say succumb, but they, they tend to develop symptoms and get infected in periods of stress. So this could be in the spring if, um, again, maybe the brood nest is, is growing pretty rapidly, but there's not enough nurse bees to adequately feed them. We think that that can help cause some of that stressful situation for European fell brood to develop. But it's not that uncommon to have the bacteria present in hives. Some bees develop it and some don't, and we're still understanding what factors are really responsible for that. So with European fell brood, I wanna start with a very textbook photo that you might often see in disease guides or in textbooks or on the internet when we talk about European fell brood. And so this is a colony that has pretty severe European fell brood. When we look at the brood nest, one of the first things we notice is that it's really spotty. There's a lot of open holes in the brood nest that don't have anything in them. And then as we look closer, we notice that there is a couple things going on with these larvae. So normally healthy larvae is in a C shape in its cell and is pearly white. But with European fowl brood, both of these things change. And when they are infected and dead, they go from pearly white to a yellowish color, then to a brownish color. And instead of sitting in that nice C shape, they can also change their conformation in the cell. So oftentimes they twist in the cell or they might not, they might just be sitting a little bit differently or look a little off. So in this photo, we're seeing a lot of cells that have infected larvae. So one like this kind of has that classic twist. It's almost like a, a corkscrew. We'll see some more photos of that later and, and just you know on the next couple of slides. This one as well uh, is twisted. This as well is kind of twisted. It's not sitting in that nice C shape as well as this one and this one and almost every single cell that we're looking at here, right? And then a lot of these are also different colors from just kind of off white like this all the way to very yellowish and brown and kind of a darker brown. And then as it dries up and becomes a scale, just like with sac brood, for instance, we see it become uh, really dark, nearly black. So this is classic European fell brood. There's a color change and there's also usually a twist in that brood. And the stage that the brood is usually dying at is usually the larval stage before the cell is capped. So we're not often seeing a lot of chewed cappings when we're looking at European fell brood. Although some brood does die after the cell is capped. So sometimes we might see like in this photo, here's a cell that does have um, a perforated capping just because that brood died when it was a little bit older compared to some of these others that do not have their edges, their cell cappings chewed off or those ragged edges. So this is another classic European fowl brood photo. Uh, this might even be from the same hive, I can't remember but we're seeing a lot of brood that is twisted in its cell. This one here, for instance, this is another kind of classic corkscrew twist. Uh, a lot of brood that is different colors, ranging from off-white to kind of creamy, all the way to brown and dark brown. So a lot of variation when it comes to European fell brood. 
One of those telltale signs that you might read about on the internet or in books talks about how with European fell brood, sometimes you see that after the brood has died and it's brown in color, you can actually uh, see the breathing tubes of that larva or the trachea. So here, if you're looking at this cell that I'm pointing my finger at, um, the, the larva's uh, skin, it's not really the skin, but it becomes kind of translucent and we're able to see the trachea, which looks almost like a net inside of the body, those white lines. And all, almost all of the larvae that we're looking at here look infected. So this one is not quite the right color. It's not that pearly white color. This one here is not sitting in its cell white and it's also off color. And this one here not sitting in its cell right and is also off color. And as well, this one at the bottom. Uh, when I'm looking at this, I do see some larvae that look okay though. For instance, this one up here looks healthy to me. Uh, and this one here, this is the right color that we're expecting to see in larvae. And as I briefly mentioned, the same as with sac brood, when a colony has European fowl brood, it will eventually dry up into a little scale. And so here we can see a scale that's kind of lying on this side of the cell, but often it's at the, the bottom of the cell or maybe the back of the cell is how I should say it. And we can see that in this one here, 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 here. And in this cell up here, we're just starting to see that that uh, brood is infected and it's drying up becoming a scale. And so now we're looking at a frame that has a lot of European fell brood scale in it. And this is a frame that was stored in someone's storage for a while. Their colony had died, but they weren't sure why. And then when they pulled this frame out, we looked at it together and we could see that there was a lot of European fell brood scale in it. And so sometimes you can even clearly see kind of the body of the larva, like here and here, where they just kind of dried up and uh, stayed as the scale in that format. And similar to sac brood, if you were to take a toothpick and try to pull this scale out, it would come out really easily. Okay, so now let's look at a couple of photos of European fowl brood that aren't so classic textbook European fowl brood. And most of the cases that we see in the field are these cases that aren't so advanced and so easy to recognize. And so in a lot of these cases, if beekeepers are looking at this, they would describe this brood as looking snotty in appearance. That's kind of a common descriptor that we hear. And with this brood, we're seeing the color change, right? So uh, we can focus on these ones here. They're starting to change color to become uh, creamy or yellowy brownish. And we're also seeing that these larvae are not sitting normally in their cells. So they, they look very, to me, the way that I kind of describe this is they kind of look swollen or wet, like kind of fluid filled. Um, I don't know what causes that, but uh, when we see this, it's, it's usually European fowl brood. Like it's almost sitting in a sea, but not quite. And it just looks uh, really swollen and it's getting brown in color. Some other larvae that have European fowl brood that wouldn't be so obvious would be these ones. So here they are twisted in their cells. They're, this one is just starting to change color, but it's not so obvious. And with cases like this, where it's only the start of the infection and only a couple larvae are starting to show these symptoms, these are ones that I'm usually catching when I'm using a flashlight to kind of quickly look at the brood. And so here we can tell I've got a flashlight shone on these cells and um, I'm noticing that there's an issue with them. This, uh, this one's a nice comparison because this larva looks healthy to me. That's a good color and that's the right way it should be sitting in itself, not like this. And also this one over here is clearly not, uh, not looking good. That's infected too. Okay, another situation where we're seeing kind of the early stages of European fowl brood, only some, uh, only a small amount of brood in this colony is infected. And when you look at it again, it's, it doesn't look right. Um, it looks kind of uh, swollen or fluid filled. Uh, it's starting to change color, but it's not so obvious. So these are European fell brood as well. 
And so I'll, I'll show a photo of the VITA test kit that you can use in the field to diagnose this. So if you have these test kits, it only takes about two minutes to tell if you have European fell brood. And what it's recognizing is a specific bacteria, which is Melissococcus plutonius. And that's the bacteria that causes European fell brood. Now, over time, after that larva dies from that bacterial infection, different bacteria or secondary bacteria move in to continue you know, feeding off of and decomposing that, that dead brood. And so when you're using the VITA test kit, it works best if the larvae that you're testing look like they're in the earlier stages of infection. So ones like these that have not really turned dark brown or started to develop into a scale. Uh, we're looking for that first primary bacteria that starts the infection. So using larvae that uh, are not really super dark brown yet, you know, like not quite this one, uh, that makes it easier to find a positive detection using the test. So another thing that we tend to see um, sometimes with European fowl brood is contaminated brood food. So here we can see that this larva, the larva itself looks okay right now. It is sitting in a C shape, it's nice and white. It's brood food that it's eating um, is yellow. And so it's becoming exposed to European fowl brood and it will eventually become infected likely from eating that. But uh, this yellowish brood food we tend to see associated with European fell brood when we're out in the field. So here is yet another photo of European fell brood that might be kind of hard to diagnose if you're seeing it in your colonies. But again, the telltale signs are a color change. So here we're seeing larvae that's turning brown. We can kind of see those uh, breathing tubes or trachea easily. Uh, this one is developing into a scale already. This one is off color. And then a couple of them are twisted in their cell, not super noticeably, but you can definitely tell that it's not lying in that C shape on the bottom. It's kind of turned upward or twisted in its cell. And then I think this is the last photo that I have for European fowl brood. Here we're seeing a couple of those early signs, right? We're seeing that yellow contaminated brood food. We're seeing um, at least one larva that's twisted on its side. And then we're also seeing some younger larvae that um, have not shown signs of infection that um, are sitting nicely in their cells and look healthy at the moment. So this is a photo of um, a VITA test kit that's for European fowl brood. It's very easy to follow the instructions. This test kit is usually about $15 from a bee supply company. And the way that it works is you take infected larvae, uh, you scoop them up with a little scoop and you put them into this solution that has some buffer. You uh, kind of shake it all up and then you apply a couple drops onto the test and you wait. And if you have just one line show up under the C for control, that shows that the test is working. If you, if you have just one line show up after it's run, that means that it's negative. And if you have two lines, one under the control and one under the test, the T, then it means that it's positive for European fowl brood. So uh, I usually scoop up many larvae and put them into this test. I think that they tell you to scoop up at least one or two uh, suspicious looking larvae. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about American fowl brood, how to recognize that. And I do wanna say that we have an entire video on recognizing, preventing, managing and reporting American fowl brood in New York State on our YouTube channel. So I'll put the link to that in the description if you wanna check that out. But just to talk about recognizing American fowl brood, this is a bacterial disease that is highly destructive. Um, it can persist in a spore form for decades. So it's very, very tricky to get rid of um, without burning the colony and burning the bees inside of it. So in New York state where I'm located, that is the law to eliminate American fowl brood by burning or through deep burial if you're not able to burn it. And American fowl brood must be reported to the state apiculturist in New York state. So let's talk about uh, how to recognize this disease. So here is a frame of a colony that has American fowl brood, just to kind of orient you for the first thing that you might see. And when I'm looking at this, I'm having the sun 
behind my back as I'm holding the frame so that the sun can shine into these uh, each of these cells. And I do want to say there were a lot of bees flying around. So some of these shadows are just from bees flying. That's not the color of the capping. I've been asked that before. That's just the shadow of bees. But what you're noticing right away is uh, this is a spotty pattern. So we're seeing a lot of these cells appear empty. Uh, if we look closer, we see that a lot of them actually have been chewed open. So this cell has a perforated capping or chewed open capping, as well as this one and this one, these ones over here, this one and this one and this one. There's even one over here. So as we're scanning the brood nest, our eye is being drawn to those perforated cappings, right? And when we look closer, we can notice that some of these, we can actually see the brood inside of them and it looks brown, right? This one, we can see some brown brood. This one we can too, this one we can too. And in here we can't. So this would be a, a situation where if you can't tell what's in there, you wanna take a toothpick and open it up and see what's inside. And in this bottom cell where the whole capping has been chewed off of, we can clearly see this dead brood. And with American fowl brood, the telltale sign is the uh, brood is melted to the bottom of the cell. So it's laying flat and it goes from being a white healthy color to kind of a beige and then this brown color that's almost like coffee with some cream in it. So a closer zoom into those cells, we can see here is um, a cell that's been opened by the bees and there is dead brood inside laying flat on the bottom of the cell and that brownish uh, creamy coffee color as well as in this one here too. And this cell just has a little bit of pollen, so that's not dead brood. And these are the ones that we'd like to open to see what they look like inside, because I can't tell. I can just tell that the bees found an issue with that brood and have started to open it up. Okay, here on this frame, we can clearly see the telltale signs of American fowl brood. There's a lot of cells that have this larva. Well, it's not a larva, it's either a pupa Pre it's, it's a pre-pupa, sorry, um, kind of laying flat in its cell, uh, that brown color. And over time, similar to European fowl brood and to sac brood, it turns into a scale as it dries up. And this scale is very black in color, and we'll look at some clear photos of that soon. But we can start to see that this brood is drying up into that black scale just on the tips. That's where it's starting. Okay, so we're seeing lots of these cells have that characteristic American fowl brood appearance. And then here are some others. Each of these. And we're starting to clearly see some scale developing in this cell, in this cell, in this cell, and this one here too. So one of the telltale signs that you'll hear about American fowl brood is that it's ropey. And this means if you take something like a toothpick or a popsicle stick, and if you poke this dead brood and pull it out, um, it's stringy and it kind of ropes out in this manner. And this happens really well if you are um, putting it in brood that looks like this, that's still kind of liquidy and mucusy in appearance. And it doesn't rope out so well if it's just kind of starting to get that brown appearance. Maybe if it's still kind of cream colored, it's not super ropey. And when it's really started to dry out, it's also not super ropey. So this is a good technique to test some of that coffee colored mucusy looking brood. But if you're seeing these signs and it's not roping, you still wanna test for American fowl brood anyways, because not every dead brood of AFB is going to be ropey. I should also say similarly, a lot of folks rely on odor to help them identify American fowl brood. The reason why it's called fowl brood is because it has this foul rancid odor. And that is just from the decomposing dead brood that's in the hive. And there have been hives that I've gone in that smell terrible. Um, even before you open them or as soon as you're cracking the lid, you get a whiff of rotting brood and you know, okay, that's American fowl brood. I know what I'm going to find in here. 
But a lot of times, if there is not a lot of dead brood in there, if it's kind of the early to mid stages of American fowl brood, you might not recognize a smell at all. So I think that anytime you're seeing um, this sign, that's kind of the most crucial thing to look for, that brood that's laying flat and that's brown in color. Uh, it probably will be ropey, but if it's not, still test it anyways, still be thorough about it because you don't want to mess around with American fowl brood. Now, sometimes the brood is a little bit older, like it's in the pupil stage, not just the pre-pupil stage before it dies. And so here we can see some of those pupae that are that same characteristic brown American fowl brood color, this one too. And kind of a classic sign when pupae die from American fowl brood is their tongue is sticking out and it's uh, connected to the side of the wall. And here we can see a, a pupae that is past, or a pupa that's past that, and it's now just kind of melting down to the bottom of its cell. Okay, so this is a very close up look of a couple different things. So, one thing here, this is. Um, this is brood that's dying from American fowl brood. It's, it's kind of that cream color. It hasn't become really brown yet. And this is like I was saying, if you were to put a toothpick in here, it wouldn't be quite as ropey as if it were, you know, a little bit later of a stage. But the main thing to focus on in here is these cappings. So if there's dead brood in here and the bees have not started to uh, chew the cappings off, what you see is instead of that nice convex shape that's on top of a healthy cell, it kind of caves in as there's this gross mucousy pupa in there and it becomes concave. And at the same time, we see this greasy appearance to these cells. And that is simply from that brown liquid starting to ooze out of the cell capping. So when folks are telling you, okay, one of the signs of American fowl brood is convex cappings or greasy cappings, that's what they're talking about. Uh, seeing some of these cells where there's dead brood in there and so the, the cell capping is kind of caving in and we start to see some of that ooze come out. All right, so here I am pointing at um, some very indicative scale in here, some classic American fowl brood scale. It's black in appearance. It's found on the bottom of that cell in that exact same place where that dead brood has kind of melted down and dried up. And what I'm not pointing at is I can see a few other um, cells that have this scale, like this one, these four along the bottom, this one as well, and this one too. And so if you are ever wanting to look for scale, if your colony died and you're not sure why, you can pull out some frames and look for scale. Or if you have frames uh, stored in your shed from a dead colony and you want to know if it's safe to use that again, or man, did those bees die from American fowl bird? I'm not too sure. Uh, it's always a good idea to, to look for it. And so when I'm looking for scale, I hold the frame in this position where right here, this is the top bar. And then down here is the bottom bar. So I can clearly see the bottom um, edge of the cells. And so kind of looking in at that angle, it's easy to tell if you have a good light source, either a flashlight like I used for this photo or sunshine, it's easy to tell that there is scale in a lot of these cells. See these black, uh, the black remnants of death in um, a lot of these cells. And some of these cells, like these ones, don't have any scale in them. So you can visually um, test for some historic American fowl brood by looking at your frames. And then, like I mentioned, there's also the VITA test kit available specifically for detecting the American fowl brood bacteria. And with this test, I've noticed that every time I've used this test, even if I'm putting a lot of infected larva in it, I always see that when it's positive, the test line is faint. Um, I don't see this with European fowl brood. I usually get two pretty strong lines, but with American fowl brood, for whatever reason, it's usually a faint line. And I wanted to mention that in case you do this test, look carefully for the test line. Uh, if it's faint, it's a positive result. So that's how you know. And then the last 
uh, brood issue that I wanted to talk about is parasitic mite syndrome or varroa mite syndrome. And unlike the diseases that we've talked about so far, parasitic mite syndrome is not a brood disease. This is um, something that is an outcome of a varroa mite infestation that has not gone well managed or has not been managed well. So over time, if varroa mites build up in the colony and uh, either the beekeeper didn't notice that there was an issue or didn't treat, or maybe the treatments weren't effective for whatever reason, a colony can develop parasitic mite syndrome. And I'm usually seeing this occurring in late summer and in early fall. And it is by far the most common of the diseases that we're talking about today. I forgot to mention how common European fell brood was. That's usually around 5% of colonies that we're inspecting in spring have European fell brood. For American fell brood, thanks to our New York state inspectors, it is quite rare. So it's usually, you know, uh, I think in recent years, it's been around 1% or less than 1% of colonies get American fell brood. But parasitic mite syndrome, it ranges yearly from 10% of the colonies that we're looking at in the fall to 25% of the colonies that we're looking at in the fall. And it really comes down to how well you're able to manage varroa and stay on top of it. So if varroa mites creep up over time, um, along with that, viruses can creep up too. So varroa mites can vector several different viruses, the most common being deformed wing virus. And when a colony gets to a point where it has high levels of varroa and high levels of viruses, it can develop this syndrome. And a lot of the symptoms that we recognize are things that we're seeing in brood. So that's why I'm including it in this recognizing brood diseases video. So with parasitic mite syndrome, uh, it's not just kind of one thing that we're looking for, but we're looking for a combination of different signs in the hive. So um, what we commonly see is called bald brood. And this isn't only caused by varroa mites, but it's commonly uh, associated with varroa mites, where the honeybees are recognizing there's an issue. And it can be that there are mites reproducing in those cells. We know that some bees are able to smell reproducing mites. And um, in a way of trying to help with that, they chew the cappings off of the brood cell. So what we're left seeing is what we call bald brood. It's this pupa that's white. It hasn't developed any hair yet. Um, it's not a developed adult. So normally we don't see this because they're under cappings, but when varroa levels start to creep up, we tend to see that bees are chewing the cappings off and we see this bald brood. In some cases, the bees will recap these cells. And in other cases, they will perform hygienic behavior and they will remove this brood. If you were to pull this brood out yourself with a toothpick, uh, you might see that it has varroa mites in it, either adult varroa mites or in this photo that I took, uh, there are two immature mites that are in that cell um, right on this pupa. So there's one here that's white in color and one here. So kind of the next stage, if bees are removing this, is they will either pull out that pupa entirely or they'll partially cannibalize it. And so in this photo, we can see the cannibalism side of things where uh, these pupal heads have been chewed off. So I can see the remnant of a purple eye here, as well as maybe in this photo here, I can see the remnants of eyes, but bees have started to eat that brood. And a study, um, has come out uh, in, in recent years uh, with the USDA that found that this chewed down brood tends to have higher levels of deformed wing virus than brood that hasn't been chewed down. So this um, cannibalism of brood might be bees trying to get a handle on that infection and trying to remove infected brood. You'll also see a spotty pattern with parasitic mite syndrome as bees are cannibalizing or removing brood, it leaves behind empty cells. Another thing that's very classic to parasitic mite syndrome, and I would pretty much only consider a colony to have this if I'm seeing this sign, is this dead brood that's kind of slumped down or melted in its cells, but it's still white in color. So it's not resembling American fowl brood because it's not turning uh, into that brown color. And when you pick it out with a toothpick, it comes out really easily, just as a little chunk. So uh, that's something that we tend to see. And we think 
our scientists think that um, this brood is, has died from viruses. And then we tend to see some signs on adults as well. So it's not uncommon to see adult bees with deformed wings, likely caused by deformed wing virus, as well as visible varroa mites. If you had your varroa monitoring kit with you, you could monitor this colony and it would be likely that it would be above the treatment threshold, uh, which is usually around 3%. So with our findings through the tech team, on average across six years that we've been sampling bees, Colonies that have parasitic mite syndrome have about a 10.5% infestation on average, uh, which is very high, much higher than the 3% threshold that we would uh, ask beekeepers to treat, to suggest that they would treat at that time. So with parasitic mite syndrome, a key thing is that we're not just seeing one or two cells that have some of these signs but instead it's widespread. It's dozens of cells inside of the colony, often dozens of cells on a single frame that are telling us, um, whoa, mites and viruses are reaching really high levels in this colony. So I'm gonna go through several photos of different colonies that have these signs of parasitic mite syndrome. So we'll start with this one here. Um, right away, we can see that there is a spotty pattern. This is in fall. So a lot of times bees start backfilling any of those cells that are open if they don't have space to put it elsewhere. But I'm seeing cells that have been uncapped. So this one here has its capping chewed off. There's bald brood or a, a bald pupa underneath. This one's been chewed off. It has a pre pupa underneath. I can see its head. It looks kind of like a larva standing up. I can see its head there. I'm seeing some more bald brood here as well as here. And I'm seeing chewed down brood. So that partially cannibalized brood is shown in this photo or this cell, as well as this cell. And I'm also seeing that kind of melted down slumped uh, pre-pupa in this cell. Here's another one. Again, a really spotty pattern. Uh, a few cells here that have partially cannibalized brood, several that have bald brood, even more over here, uh, chewed down brood over here, bald brood in these cells. Uh, looks like, so it looks like this cell has been chewed open and there's a partially cannibalized brood in there. And it, it looks like there's an immature mite on the side of the cell. I think I can see its legs. And again, more signs of mite damage over here. So this is just a very small area that I've zoomed in on in a photo, but you can see just how widespread these, um, this damage is. A lot of cells are showing those signs. So elsewhere in the same colony, I'm seeing lots of brood that's kind of that melted sort of slumped brood that's still white in color. It hasn't, it hasn't changed as well as shown in here. And a couple uh, cells that have been perforated or have their cappings chewed off. It's not uncommon to see varroa mites in brood at this point when a colony has developed parasitic mite syndrome or varroa mite syndrome. And again, we're looking at, um, this actually isn't the maybe the greatest photo, but um, maybe I should have brightened it. <laughs> but we can see some of that larvae kind of slumped down here, or not larvae, pre-pupae, slumped down, laying flat. This one's kind of laying on the side. A lot of these, if you look closely, you can see them lying in here. And having a flashlight to shine in these cells would be really easy to see. And another one here where we have it, um, Chewed open, I can see that pre-pupa. And even though it's, stand, it's head is kind of standing up pointy like that, I, I don't think that this is sac brood because it's still white in color. And I'm seeing a lot of these other signs that are telling me, okay, we have varroa mites and virus issues in this colony. And I guess, you know, if we're, if we're seeing, um, if, if we're seeing brood that kind of looks like this, like maybe it's on the side of its cell or it's laying flat, it is a good idea to use things like your American foul brood test kit or your European foul brood test kit and to monitor for Varroa because that can help you rule out like, oh, gee, it's laying flat. Could that be American foul brood? Um, you know, pulling it out with a toothpick to make sure that it's not roping at all. Um, all of these things can help you kind of narrow down what you're looking at. 
and uh, seeing lots of varroa mites. So uh, when I pulled off this top brood box, now I'm at the bottom brood box during my hive inspection, I can see that there's several mites in this brood that's being ripped open accidentally. So this one larva has three varroa mites in there. I think this is another one right here. And when I'm looking at the adults, it's also not that hard to find bees that have varroa mites. Usually when we're at the point of seeing any varroa mites, our mite levels are usually starting to creep up because it's, it's difficult to see such small mites on bees. And most of the mites are usually on the underside or the abdomen of the bee. And so just kind of quickly looking at this small area of bees, I can see there's a varroa mite here. Um, there's also a varroa mite here on this bee's uh, abdomen, kind of under its wing. Same with this bee here, I'm seeing another varroa mite. And I'm also seeing another varroa mite here. So um, it's pretty easy to spot some. And if I can spot that many that quickly, then our levels are likely high. You should monitor right away and see what they are. In this, um, frame, we're seeing a couple cells of bald brood. So we've got one up here that's capping's been chewed off and there's an undeveloped pupa, as well as this one and this one down here. And then we're seeing bees that have deformed wings as well. So we've got this bee here that has deformed wings as well as this one. And this is, I think, one of the last photos that I have showing that melted, gross brood. So laying flat in its cell. Um, some of these might be tricky to tell apart from things like European fowl brood because this one does look a little twisted and this one does look a little darker. But again, use your tests and you can rule, uh, you can rule things out and narrow it down. Kind of my classic um, way that I like to put it is with parasitic mite syndrome, you're not only seeing this kind of melted brood, but you're also seeing chew down brood. You're also seeing bald brood. You're also seeing deformed wings. You're also seeing varroa mites. You're seeing all of those things in the hive. If it was one of those brood diseases, typically all the signs you're seeing are in that brood. Oh, I do have at least one more photo. Okay, so here we're seeing again, tons of varroa damage. Lots of these cells are impacted. Lots of these cells have had their cappings chewed off. I'm seeing cells that are uh, partially cannibalized, as well as bees that have deformed wings. Again, here's the same thing. Widespread varroa damage, bald brood, chewed down brood, this kind of melted looking brood. And here as well. Here I'm also seeing a visible varroa mite on this adult bee. And I'm also seeing um, varroa feces. So when varroa mites are reproducing in their cells, they defecate in one specific area. And uh, this is usually on like the ceiling of the cell, kind of on the side. But I'm noticing in some of these cells like this one, I'm seeing a little white patch on the ceiling on the side right here, as well as in this one, it looks like it could also be some varroa mite feces. And with that, oh, here, here's another one. And that can kind of be another, another clue to look out for to tell if you've got high varroa levels in your colony. And I have a video that a beekeeper shared with me showing um, this varroa poop cluster or guanine crystals, we call it, um, inside of a cell. So here kind of to orient you, this is one cell that has drone brood inside of it. So here's one eye of the drone and here's the other eye. And then we've got at least three varroa mites, one, two, three. And then this is the area where they are defecating. And so in this video, you're going to see this varroa mite defecating on that area. That's it. So uh, you can kind of recognize that spot when you are inspecting your colonies. And it can be really helpful actually when you're inspecting your dead oats as well. When there's no bees left in a hive and you're trying to figure out, gosh, why did it die? 
if you're seeing some of these signs that we talked about, like bald brood, some remnants of chewed down brood, as well as lots of cells that have um, this uh, little poop cluster, then that can help you understand what your varroa situation was like during the winter and how that might've played a role in your colony losses. All right, so all the photos that I showed you with parasitic mite syndrome are showing you know, widespread damage. Even in those close-up areas, we were seeing tons of cells either had bald brood, chewed down brood, melted down larvae. We were seeing lots of visible varroa mites. But because varroa is so common, um, and even at all times of the year, we have some level of varroa going on in our colonies, it's not that uncommon to see some varroa damage. So these were the two photos that I showed at the beginning of the video where we had just two cells that showed some melted brood in them, or this one cell over here that had um, some of its cell capping chewed off. And when we're seeing just a couple, we don't consider that parasitic mite syndrome. That's just varroa damage. It's still very important information for us to have as beekeepers, because seeing this tells me, oh, I should really monitor that colony to see if it's time for a treatment. I'm starting to see signs of damage. Um, maybe I'm at the point where I need to uh, interfere as a beekeeper and help them. So it's important to kind of distinguish just seeing a, a couple affected cells here and there from seeing widespread um, signs of varroa damage and viruses. Okay, so we covered five diseases and looked at photos to recognize some of the characteristic traits of each of those diseases. And it might still be kind of tricky for you to narrow them down because there are some similarities among them. And so what I kind of do or uh, recommend when I'm talking about how to really narrow down what we're looking at, we um, are usually seeing with a lot of these diseases a spotty pattern, right? That's often one of the first things that stands out to us. And that's because bees perform hygienic behavior to try to remove dead brood or infected brood or infested brood. So with all of these diseases and, and parasitic mite syndrome, we can see this spotty pattern. So when you're in your colonies, always look closer at any of the open cells, whether there's just a little spottiness or whether there's a lot of spottiness, uh, look closer for some of those signs that we talked about. If you're seeing chewed cappings, check what's underneath. Remember, if it's a disease that occurs after the cell has been capped or if the brood is dying after a cell has been capped, then we see those chewed cappings as honeybees are recognizing there's an issue and they start to open up the cell to see what's going on. So with chewed cappings, we might see bald brood or chewed down brood, which tends to be indicative of varroa mites and the viruses that they vector. Bald brood can be caused by other things, but we, with how often I'm seeing it in recent years, it's usually associated with high levels of varroa. And often when I'm pulling out these bald brood that I'm seeing, they've got varroa mites in those cells. If we're seeing this um, chunk of uh, brood that resembles chalk, and if it has uh, some black fruiting bodies on it, then that tells us that it's chalk brood. If we're seeing this goopy, brown, sunken, mucusy looking pre-pupa lying flat. American foul brood is the telltale sign. Or if we're seeing this um, pre-pupa with a pointy head standing up uh, that's changing colors and darkening, then sac brood is usually the culprit. And then if you're seeing brood that is looking dead, you know, not sitting in a C shape, not that pearly white color, or if it's ropey, that tells us a little bit more. So these ones that are kind of white in their cell and slumped over and associated with other signs of varroa damage at the same time in the colony, that tells us that it's likely uh, varroa and the viruses that they're transmitting that can be uh, responsible for this sign. If we're seeing that they're yellowish or kind of starting to turn brown and twisted in their cells, that's indicative of European foul brood. And again, if it's laying flat and brown and ropey, then that's indicative of American foul brood. And so if you go into your colonies after this and you see something that's off and you're still not confident as to what it is, uh, the best steps that you can take are to test it 
So um, use a VITA test kit to see if it's European Felbrood or American Felbrood. If you're not sure, you can also send a sample to the USDA Beltsville Bee Lab and check their website first to make sure that they are accepting samples from beekeepers, but oftentimes they're willing to take free samples to help you identify what's going on. And lastly, use your network of beekeepers to your advantage. Reach out to your local club and the experienced beekeepers that are within it. Send them photos of what you're seeing in your hive. Reach out to a local extension agent and see if they're willing to come check out your colony or again, look at a photo. And reach out to your, um, your government agency. So whether it's a state apiculturist or a provincial apiculturist, see if you can reach out to them and schedule having an inspector actually check out your colonies. There are lots of folks that are willing to help you figure out what's going on in your hive. And even if you don't know exactly what disease you're looking at, being able to recognize that there is an issue and knowing who to reach out to to get that diagnosis is just as important. So I hope that this video helps you narrow down some of these brood diseases and helps you gain confidence in strengthening this skill for your own colonies.